of the proceeds. But you were in an apartment before that, kind of on yeah, your own? Yeah, just an apartment. You went from an apartment to a house with kids? With two kids, man, and then back what to What was that like, just making that transition from... Well, you see, it's, it's, it's driving me nuts. Well, <laughs> well, back then I, I was really a pathetic guy in that, you see, the, the saddest thing in the world is a loner, which I was. A loner trying not to be one. In other words, a loner that doesn't know themselves. And what happens is people with sociopathic characters uh, that, that are loners, what happens is all their life, all the way up through the present, they are programmed, they're bombarded by hundreds of messages every day telling them that any activity is only valid if they do it with someone else. Every bit of advertising in the world, every in cultural message that you receive, everything is, is programming you to the fact that any activity you do is only validated if you do it with someone else. You, you, you never, you know, it, whatever it is, it's, it's multiples. It, it, and yeah, I, I can remember a good example. I, I had a season pass for Six Flags in the summer of 78. And I told someone, uh, I'm going to Six Flags tonight. And they said, uh, oh, who are you going with? Well, I wouldn't go with anyone. I just had a season pass. I'd go out there. and It's the summer evenings, long evenings. I'd just go and people watch, ride rides, do what I wanted to. It was always awkward, a single person getting on a ride. You know, it had two seats. But hey, there'd be uh, some other idiot there. <laughs> oh, they put me with him. And I had a great time. I saw all these people and all the, the colors and sights and sounds of Six Flags. Yeah. It was great. Summer evenings and everything. And I said, oh, no one. I'm going alone. They go, oh, well, you know. But that's the attitude of society. I mean, when was the last time you went to a movie alone? Okay. Okay. Never. <laughs> You'd be afraid to. Okay. You'd think people would think you were odd. People are, are enculturated and programmed to only believe that life is valid if they're doing it with others. So the problem with these poor loners, the sociopaths, is they're so programmed like that, that in spite of themselves, they don't know themselves. They don't understand that there's no hope for them. They don't understand, <laughs> they don't understand that they're a round peg in a square hole and that they're never going to fit in. They don't understand that there's no way in the world that they are going to get the real satisfaction out of a human relationship. They don't understand that any human relationship they have will always be less than fulfilling. They don't understand that. And they're trying to be like everyone else. But they're not. So, so, kind of so a, it's, the thing that's so wrenching about it is, number one, two things. Number one is, when they're trying to be like everyone else and they're not, what happens is, number one, they're not going to get the satisfaction. They're always going to have an odd disconnect, number one. And number two, and really the saddest thing is, no matter how much they try to be like everyone else, it's not going to be good enough for everyone else. Mm -hmm. They're not going to fit in and they're not going to be accepted. That's terrible. That's terrible. So that's and that I, kind yeah. of experience movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. See, you know, but I didn't, real, I didn't understand myself until uh, 21, actually when I got a dog. And, and all of a sudden I was no longer alone and I didn't have that wrenching sense of, of loneliness and being alone, but yet there would be no salvation in the company of others. Mm. You're alone, you're, your life is empty, alone, lonely, but there's, there's no salvation or satisfaction in the, in, in the company of others. It's a terrible, I see many, those are the worst kind of people. They're, they're tragically unhappy. And well, so well, the restroom, man, quick. I don't uh, have too much coffee myself. Hey, give me another cup if there's any left. You want another one there? Mm -hmm. So what was it like uh, being with kids and then, you know, you... Uh, well, I'm I'm kind of okay, like, now, they, that's the answer to I'm kind of question. I was guy. trying to be normal. I'm kind of an apartment guy myself, you know, and then... Oh, you're, from, you're not married? No. Oh. Then you go from, from, you know, your own time, your own thing to living with, were they boys, girls? What, what? I, yeah, a boy and a girl, and... Oh. And both. I, uh, you know, I was trying to be normal. Was but I wasn't, working? I was involved in fraud. I, I didn't even have a job. You know, finally Sue told me, you know, because uh, I was presenting it to her that I was a self-publisher and so forth, and these deals were sponsored and they were real, they were real. 
I even had her picking up money for me at the beginning of our relationship. Did she catch on to that, or was yeah, it? She, when she did, she said, "Man, it's not a job. It's a kind of game." She said, <laughs> and she was. Did you kind of try to keep that from her, or kind of try to hold it together a little bit, as far as yeah, not wanting to lose it, but uh, maybe yeah. she wouldn't. Oh, she caught on. And in the end, I think she's probably the one that turned me in. Yeah. Turned you in for. A fraudulent telephone solicitation. Oh. After right, as soon as, soon as we were divorced, I got busted out. I had an office in uh, Decatur. Got busted out by Decatur County, and mm -hmm. uh, had a phone room. Yeah, busted me right on out. Took everything. Phone, <laughs> phone, everything. Except when was me. this? This was in '79. Uh, you got busted in '79, or yeah, at the end of '79. Right after our divorce. Did you get any time for it? Or? Oh no, it was a misdemeanor. Fraudulent telephone solicitation. But they didn't give you any of your phones back or your office? Oh, man, they did all this work on it, including running an undercover officer through the operation. They ran a black female juvenile uh, officer, a police officer, through the operation, had her come get a job, work a day there. And then when they came for the arrest, they showed up with crime scene vans uh, with their own boxes. Now, were you were you married at the time? No, no we, we had been divorced just a week or two or a month or, or whatever. I think our divorce was final in about October the 20th. How'd that divorce go? Was it kind of, well, with any of you, was it more an amicable thing like oh, you yeah. both decided or was it? Yeah, like, yeah, no. It was, did you call it quits with her or did? Well, yeah, uh, I had and then she had. She had, had, okay. enough, had enough too. I mean, you know. Oh, well, she had been shopping him out by then, and she already had the next guy lined up. No, oh, didn't Oh, yeah, yeah. How did yeah. you react to that? Mm. Well, I, I, had, I had to laugh, you know. Uh, I think, it's, it's, you know, these, these girls say looking for a husband, and I call it sleeping around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it's, it's all in your perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, she the fuck out the police department out there already <laughs> before she met me. Oh, she had fucked the captain. Uh, she had Did she tell you this, or is this oh, yeah. she kind of learned? Oh, 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 oh no, she told me. Oh no, she was crazy. Oh, God, Lord. like how she was. She was one of her boyfriends was making. Uh, uh, not a police officer, but one of her boyfriends was making uh, eight million. You know, they had. Uh, you know, well, he didn't have a video, very little video at there, and was making eight millimeter films of her dancing nude. You know. I, how did that come up in conversation with the, yeah. with the new husband? There? Oh, that's the way it always is. Don't you know that? <laughs> if you go on with someone sooner, it gets over sooner or later, and it's typically the chick because she's the one that's got the pussy and can fuck any time she wants. Sooner or later, it comes around to all the people I've fucked. It always ends up that way. Don't you know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Anytime you have a relationship, you can go on with someone, and sooner or later, it's who else have you fucked? And and almost invariably, at least with the chicks I go to, go with, uh, they 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 want to tell you, you know. Yeah, and, and the reason why, <laughs> obviously, I, I missed out on an important part of the conversation. I mean, and the reason why is that you see, and it's a fine distinction, uh, for women to threaten to give it away, that pussy, I mean, and for them to let you know that they could give it away and they have given it away, increases the value of it. Howard, there's a, it's no, marketing. But a sophisticated woman understands that to threaten to give it away increases the value, and actually giving it away to someone else decreases the value. And some women aren't smart enough to know the difference, and they fuck up that way. Was that Sue, or? They all do that! <laughs> <laughs> they all do that! You know how they do it? You know, the nice girls do? Are you married? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the nice girls, you know how they, all, they do it? They say, either you marry me or forget about it, I'm going to find someone else. That's the threatening to give it away. That's, that is what it is, okay? <laughs> and that's how they get men to do what they want them to do. Oh, yeah. Always, yeah. Either you do what I want or in the end, I'm going to give it to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And you see, that part of my uh, dislike, or I wouldn't call it hatred, but almost, for women is that they have all the advantages. That guy, that, that gets stuck against me. That, oh, I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. And I, so I finally came to the conclusion, uh, I mean, the last piece of ass I had, except for rape here, was in 89. It was in January of 89. 
And I never what kind of dropped out of the game there. I was never so happy after I did that. Oh yeah. Well, once you stop getting led around by the dick, and we all are, dirt like a fucking animal. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, all of us are. We're. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's why we become less than men. That's why we start doing a woman's agenda. Hey, listen. How many little nine-year-old boys have have said to the little girls? Oh, you know, I would like you to get your toy tea set out, and let's have a tea, and let's get our dollies here, and have tea with our dolly. You've never seen a boy do that. But that's what a woman wants you to do as an adult, is to play house, okay, and to have children. How many nine-year-old boys, now, don't get me wrong, I understand that uh, for many men, having children is, is the greatest thing in their life. But nevertheless, how many nine-year-old boys have you known that have said, oh, you know, I don't want to be a soldier or a pilot or astronaut. I want to grow up and, and have a family. <laughs> Bullshit. Okay. That's not what men are about. Okay. <laughs> but in the end, puberty happens. The hormones rise. We start getting led around by our dick. You get that tax break. All and, that and in the end, we become women. You look at any married couple, virtually, when I say any, that's a big word, but, you know, virtually any married couple, especially the older one. And what you have is not a man and a woman. Woman, You have two women, and one of them has a penis, and he's the designated dick, you know. It's like, honey, you know, can you give me my dick back tonight, you know. And you have two women doing the things that a woman wants to do and having the values that a woman has and leading a woman's agenda with the so-called man given permission to do symbolic, almost ritual things that make him the man. It may be whatever. It may be having his collection of snap-on tools in the garage. You know, it may be it, his haunty days. It, you know, it could be his fishing or his hunting. These are symbolic, ritualistic things that they're allowed to do to say they're the men. And even generally the toughest of men, roughest and toughest, generally they go home to a soft house, to a soft woman's environment, to a nice nice. Look at those damn Muslims we're fighting. Man, they sit against a damn mud wall on their damn ass and eating fucking shit with their hands. And there ain't no pictures on the wall because they can't have pictures. It's forbidden to to, you know, by Muslim to, and, and they're just, they're tough as fucking nails. They're thin, they're wiry, they eat a handful of mud every day and they shit once a week. They sit on the fucking floor, oh man, and here our so-called men, they go home to cushy cushy and everything's nicey nicey and it's all got the woman's touch and everything. There's two women there. Did you look at any man's home. You look at any man's, I'll ask you a question in a minute. You ain't look at any man's home. It ain't a man's home. It's a woman's home. <laughs> and what is this man thing? Having a nice lawn. Oh, Jesus Christ. Give me a fucking break. Out there cutting grass and digging in the dirt like a fucking animal. All, you know? all, your, uh, all your travels and, and camping and stuff, you get by yourself, you get a lot of time to... To thinking. That's the thing. People have a lot of insight now. Okay. Uh, lawyers and everyone else ask me constantly, how come you're so seemingly intelligent? Are you well read? Are you well educated? You're right. You hit it right on the head. That's very perceptive of you. The reason I'm so seemingly intelligent is that I, alone amongst almost anyone, including you dudes, have time to actually stop and think about things. You, have you don't have time to stop and think about things. Mm -hmm. You are so busy distracting yourself because you're running from really the reality of this situation, which is you're going to fucking die. And you are so busy just frantically, desperately distracting yourself with every kind of thing in the world, including your work. Now, again, I'm not judging you. I mean, you're just human beings. That's all you are. You're just human beings, and God bless you. I mean, if there is, you know, Lord, I'm not judging you, but I'm just saying, you're so embedded in this matrix that you live in that you can't even see it. Again, I'll refer you back to what the advertised. Get the persuaders, pbs.com, two 
two one-hour shows called The Persuaders on Advertising. An academic saying, in other words, this is academic thought, not orthodox academic thought. He says, the goal of advertisers has always been not only to suffuse the atmosphere, but to be the atmosphere, and to leave us no way out of or around the world they have created for us. That's orthodox academic thought. If you studied advertising and got a degree in it, that's what you would learn, that the goal is to be the atmosphere and to leave us no way out of or around the world they've created for us. And they succeeded. <laughs> you are so embedded matrix of culture, you don't even know it. Sociologists as early as the late 70s, and certainly by 1982, were dealing with the concept of, of virtual reality, of hyper-reality, and the fact that we are so divorced because of all these distractions that we have entered, because of this totally artificial world and environment, and environment of thought that we built around us, that we can't know what's real and we shouldn't even try. <laughs> and you can. And the, the, so you don't. You, you're just too busy distract. You don't even know. Uh, and you can't see the horse go with it. But that's the thing. You, you hit right on it. The reason I seem to be intelligent is I alone, uh, amongst very few people, have the time to think. And when you're into hiking, and when you're into running, and you're hiking and hiking every day, <laughs> or you're walking your dog every, every day, two, two or three hours, you know, and you're walking, you're walking, and walking, right? You got to stay heads up and watch the dog and make sure you don't get run over. And it's always like a combat patrol and that you're going to have to fight at any time. You may hear the clickety-clack of dog nails behind you and spin around and there's a shepherd in your face ready to rumble, okay? So it is that kind of combat patrol kind of thing. But otherwise, you got time to think. That's one of my personalities. I'm a philosopher, I'm a soldier, I'm a scientist, and I'm an artist. Well, and those are all distinct personality types that represent different, distinctly different things. And, and I'm all of them. And what it really is, 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 is two opposing pairs. You have the rational, intellectual soldier and the scientist, the coldly rational uh, soldier. Uh, the, the the coldly, yeah, and the coldly rational scientist. The scientist, if it can't be demonstrated, it doesn't exist. It's only a theory. You know, you got to show me the facts in science, okay? So those two are the coldly rational ones. The artist and the philosopher are interested more in the textures and, and the why and wherefore is behind it, you see. So, so you're having the balance between the two? I have all those there, and, and it's not as complex as it sounds. If you know, know, if you're aware that I'm a soldier, a scientist, uh, an artist, and a philosopher, if you're aware of that, then I'm a very simple person even though I may seem to be a startling juxtaposition of, what's you know, your, What's your artistic side? What, what do you mean by artist? Well, by artist, I mean truly in the sense of being an artist, in that you see everything in terms of not the linear, but the impression of it, right. and so forth. And as far as a medium goes, uh, I'm an artist that people ask me, you know, I tell them I'm an artist, and they say, well, what's your medium? Are you a sculptor? Or Right. No, my artist, my art is my life, and my art is weird. No, laugh, laugh. I'm no, no. <laughs> no, an artist. My no. art is my life, no, and my I, art is weird. I'm actually, laugh, no, I'm actually, laugh. No, I'm actually <laughs> not into this. Okay. Laugh. Of course, it's true. It's all true. Yeah. It's true. It's real. Well, Everything well, I'm telling you is true. Everything I'm telling you is real. 